did you know that the account aggregator framework recently logged a milestone of 100 million consents. Its user base is estimated to be around 90 million. Did you know that India ranks third in the world in terms of number of fintechs as well as fintech unicorns? Welcome to another edition of Capital Calculus. I'm your host, Anil Padmanabhan. As I mentioned in the introduction, the account aggregator framework recently logged a milestone. It is very important because this technology platform is revolutionizing the idea of credit in India. Previously, to avail of a loan, you would have to put up some asset as a collateral, not any longer. What the A framework does is to monetize your data, including cash flows, to create the desired credit history. This pivot away from lending based on assets to one based on cash flows is solving for the credit needs of millions of underserved Indians. For example, the small and medium enterprises credit needs are estimated at around $300 billion. Previously, they would not have had access to formal sources of credit and would have to consequently lean on expensive informal means. This also puts the spotlight on the third coming of fintech in India. Coincidentally, on the eve of the global fintech fest, which kicked off in Mumbai today. To understand this third coming of fintech in India, I spoke to Srinivas Jain. He is the head of strategy, digital and technology at SBI Mutual Fund. I began by asking Srini about his thoughts on this happy coincidence. At one level, the account aggregator framework logged 100 million consents. At another level, ONDC, which is revolutionizing the idea of e-commerce in India, just launched financial services as an offering. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, It was in the making and it's happened. 100 million consents was the first milestone we want to achieve. Uh, and this has been a, it's, it's been, it's been pretty good. Uh, so the milestone is kind of, you know, it's kind of a transformation in how financial data is kind of shared, utilized across the ecosystem in India. So it's a good thing, but keep in mind, uh, all DPIs that were developed in India took uh, years to do. I mean, Aadhaar took many years before it became big. So did UPI, right? So uh, you 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 needed a catalyst like Aadhaar took uh, a DBT as a catalyst. So you needed something like a, a direct benefit to work for which Aadhaar was essential and Aadhaar was then took off, right? Uh, so similarly, uh, UPI had its moment with uh, demonetization and uh, COVID uh, and, and that just skyrocketed. Now, those kind of events have not happened for other DPIs yet. So. Uh, organically doing a 100 million uh, transaction itself is a fairly big thing uh, from my perspective. So uh, that's that's good. Uh, similarly, ONDC also requires another you know big push. It's been it's been revolutionary DPI. It requires a lot of these integrations and a lot of uh, visibility and of course many fintechs and others kind of uh, building on top of it. Uh, and that's something that we will see. 100 million, according to me, is a very very small piece considering what, let's say, what UPI is doing today in terms of, I think, last month alone, they did, what, 2 trillion uh, transactions. So it's a, it's a the, the future is very bright for uh, fintech, especially building on top of DPIs. Srini, this uh, DPI is uh, actually, uh, it's a very interesting concept, which India is among the global leaders in this. So can you just take a step back and explain to our viewers the significance of digital public infrastructure, particularly the interoperability component? Right. So one of the things, you know, if you go back and see uh, uh, post-independence, and it was a need of the art that we build a public infrastructure for all of us, right? So we build a physical infrastructure. We build dams, beaches, roads, uh, you know, all of that stuff that was requ required to improve productivity. It was improved to require you know, efficiency, uh, economic development. 
we've been doing it for 20 years. We still have to do a lot more. We, we still have to play a lot of roads and railways. And, but that's kind of an auto mode, right? So it's kind of happening and it's essential stuff. But the world has changed a lot. In the last uh, 10 to 15 years, we've uh, revolutionized the way uh, digital penetration has happened. So it was needed for India to build a DPI. And it's also because, you know, we, we take a lot about uh, saying that we are the we are going to become the third largest economy in the world, but our our uh, you know our uh, per capita is still around three thousand dollars, right? So it's a it's a long way to go. And the only way we can think about all this uh, twenty forty seven uh, number of being a developed economy is to actually uh, you know innovate and revolutionize the stuff. You know, do things which people have not done in the world and build to scale that will ben benefit everybody in the population. So somewhere, uh, this was the back of the mind uh, of the policymakers when they started uh, thinking about DPI. Of course, the key part of it is all confidence, right? We built very, you know initial DPIs to help um, expand the KYC business or identity. And one above the other thing started moving up. The good news about it is that we are being capital starved uh, country. We cannot think about investing huge money in building um, you know, infrastructure that in individual entity can own and run. So the idea was that the government gets involved in both thinking, structuring, and building and in, in a, a back-end capability where anybody and everybody can take it up and build a front-end capability. So that was the whole idea of uh, DPI that was uh, being built. So, uh, you know, you know, today we built it on a complete portable uh, framework. It is completely, you know, anybody and everybody who's regulated can use this requirement, uh, whether it's digital commerce, whether it was, um, you know, consent architecture. Uh, and of course, now, uh, you know, other DPIs that we're building on health and others are actually, you know, improving both the quality and are bringing in high quality uh, and innovative uh, solutions to the market, which today with our per capita and our uh, commercial, what do you call uh, um, our amount of investing is uh, very, very fairly limited. And this is how I think we will move towards the 2047 goal of being a developed nation. So digital public infrastructure is going to be the most critical um, you know, investment that we will do for the next decade or so. Srini, from what you just said, it must be clear that two things stand out. One, the introduction of DPI and then, of course, the fintech example is reducing right. friction in the economy. Right thereby will impact productivity. Also, isn't it democratizing access because you're now taking, or rather you're able to take services to the customer rather than the other way around, you know? No, no, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, if you think about it, uh, the, the market of India exists because of the size and scale. And the market was not a homogeneous market in the physical world. It, it was a you know different market. And if you go back and see how the FMCG companies look at it, looked at it as a India as a market, it was a people physically had to build all these capabilities. One thing that the internet did and the 5G penetration, 4G penetration did, and mobile penetration did was to make it a largely a homogeneous market, the addressable market. And thanks to that, the entire democratization piece that we have been talking about, inclusion, bringing financial services to the last mile, was possible. So there was a physical infrastructure that was built and DPI kind of leveraged on top of it. Today, there are two, three large benefits of DPIs. One is, of course, the tech stack is standard, right? Nobody has to develop, maintain, retain that stuff. So it's regulatory OK because you're building on top of it. The second thing is the unit economics. The India is a very, very... Uh, you know, everything has to be on a frugal level uh, and because affordability is very low. So if you think about DPI today, of course, initially people were crying that MDRs are low and all today things are kind of stabilized. So the unit economics works very well. The scale is so large that, you know, when you bring down the access cost to significantly low, then the, you know, the affordability of that to the last mile then goes up significantly. You can see that in sanitization of financial products that are going, whether it's about small ticket loans or whether it's about access to information, all of this is happening. And the third thing that's there is uh, kind of breaking the monopoly, right? We are not, India is a very unique market where we have not got um, the big three of the world who will have their own data architect, everything, all the data stays with everybody, but only those guys. And if you have to access, you'll have to advertise in the platform or pay for it. Now, 
that worked and that still works for majority of the world. But in India, we are taking a very different approach. We are saying you, your USP needs to be how you offer things to your customer, not because you own a platform, right? The, and the innovation is that you bring on top of it. So as the platform started getting, you know, unitized or democratized, the offering started getting more smarter. The smartest of the guys will survive rather than the ones who are sitting on either network or data or things like that. Uh, to that extent, I think India has done a phenomenal job uh, of, uh, you know, making sure that the, and the ecostructure thrive, right? India is the largest fintech ecostructure. Srini, there's a new gorilla in the room, generative API, AI, artificial intelligence. How yeah. do you see this influencing the next phase of growth of fintech in India in particular? Yeah, so I think uh, Gen AI is now... Uh, how do I say? One, we talk a lot about it. I mean, there's absolutely no explainers needed for that. But the point here is, I think Gen AI is at some level going to become a commodity, and it is becoming a commodity. Right? So uh, models and structures and stuff like that, and that will be kind of present, omnipresent in everything that we do in in coming days. There was a time when analytics was a big thing. There was a time when people were using ML models. Now we have Gen AI models, which are much large language models and even specialized small language models used for uh, purpose required. I think FinTech per se will be a fairly large beneficiary, beneficiary of this, right? You know, things like personalization, customization, optimization, things like that, you know, analyzing will help risk management. That's something that Gen AI can do really well because there are certain things the human mind does very well. And there are certain things that uh, you need a large language model or large models to help you visualize some of the large challenges. So risk management is something that will be there. So you will see um, very aggressively fintech being adopted. Finally, uh, Srini, uh, it's also the day one of the global fintech summit. How do you see this year's summit play into our conversation about uh, giving fintech a second life as it were in India? Yeah, I think um, yeah, the Global FinTech Festival is now the marquee festival globally. And um, it's so large that we have people coming from all over the world. Almost, uh, you know, 150 policymakers will be there. There are, you know, you know, global speakers of many repute. Of course, we have, you know, Indian leaders, like from prime minister to finance minister to ministers who have spoken in this event for many years. This year also, we have a massive lineup of very powerful speakers that are coming. What really excites me about this year uh, clearly is that after five years of Global FinTech Festival, I mean, the fifth year, we're really, really maturing in terms of uh, really taking India to the world. Um, we started Global FinTech Festival thanks to the push by uh, government saying, you know, we have so much stuff to talk to the world we've not been able to do. Unfortunately, the first few were on lit, you know, were done as a non physical event thanks to COVID. And the last uh, couple of them have been very, very successful. I think taking India to the world requires uh, exposing Indian capability to the world. That requires a lot of these um, show and tell kind of events, talking about policy frameworks, talking about collaborations, uh, how this is done. So I think the the what we call as DP, DPI 2.0 and 3.0 drive for inclusion and things like that, that needs to be what we are already talking. It needs to be told to the world. This year, I think you will see more of that. There's a focus on... ESG is one of the parameters and India is trying to lead um, you know, that. Uh, there is a focus on AI, of course, is uh, talk of the town. AI is something that um, in, we want to showcase how AI is being effectively used in Indian fintech and how it can be used from a global perspective. There's a lot more that's happening. And fintech per se is, in India has matured so much. Um, it is now about giving them opportunity to talk about what they're already doing and how can they scale globally. And it's also for global, uh, you know, market players to come and experience what's happening here in India. So if you think about it, one of the most attractive thing that happens in GFF 20 uh, this year, I mean, it's last year too, is the footfall. We will have like something like 80,000 footfalls uh, happening during that period. It's massive and it's a massive event for showcasing product. There'll be more than 100 plus product launches during uh, these three days. Uh, and there'll be a lot of policy frameworks done, a lot of closed door meetings, uh, I don't know, hundreds of closed door meeting with uh, with players, a lot of parallel session happening uh, in the event. And most importantly, what I really love about the energy that comes out of this uh, convention is largely the 
the ground floor, which is where all the 300 plus stalls are, where actual talent is showcased and actual products are showcased. You know, I, I you know, I've been involved in the project, but I, I don't even physically have time to go around and see all this innovation. But I do, uh, I do read about it, and people put it out there, and I, I do meet many people. This is a fantastic, it's a buzzing event with so many innovators, so many uh, companies coming. It is not just the fintechs; it's the technology companies, it's the large banks and financial institutions showcasing. Of course, regulator themselves. Last year, CBDC was launched as part of the project in uh, in GFF. This year, also some very interesting products will be launched as part of GFM. Srini is right. The first phase of the digital public infrastructure in India was built on the foundation of Aadhaar and UPI. Similarly, DPI 2.0 was developed on the foundation of ONDC, Health Stack and so on. The third phase of DPI is going to be built on the foundation of artificial intelligence. While DPI 1.2 and 2.0 solved for the problem of identity, democratized payments, and enabled more universal access to health insurance, DPI 3.0 is going to solve for the credit needs of millions of underserved Indians. Undoubtedly, a potential force multiplier. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to Strat News Global on YouTube. Hit the bell icon so that you don't miss any updates. And please, to share your thoughts, ideas, and suggestions with us, I'm available on Twitter at Capital Calculus. I'll be back next week with another episode. Till then, stay safe.